Okay, okay Gabriel, whatever you're ready. Okay. So, uh, thanks very much uh, for the invitation to this wonderful place and this very nice conference. This is the title of the talk, it's a rather long title. Uh, it was originally meant to be two talks, one, the first one by, by me and then the second one by Silvesh, but Silvesh unfortunately couldn't come. So, the title of the talk is uh, Implementation of Active Flow for N equals to 4 GPS black holes from Black Hole Microscape Company. And this is based on work done in collaboration with a bunch of people, namely Adhigam Kirambi, Suresh Nakuri, Alan Dahais, and Marty Rossala. And it appeared uh, over the years uh, in these papers. So this is going to be a talk about GPS black holes in four dimensions in asymptotically flat space time. Now, it's well known that black holes behave like thermodynamic systems, so they have an entropy, which to read more that is given by the area law of Beckenstein and Hawking, so here A denotes the area of event horizon. But then, of course, there may be all kinds of sublimit corrections. There could, for instance, be a logarithmic area sublimit correction, power law sublimit corrections, exponentially sublimit corrections, all kinds of things. On the other hand, entropy is also a measure for the for the number of microstates of the system. So this entropy here should also be derivable or viewable as the logarithm of the number of microstates of the system. And the central question on the gravity, of course, is what are these microstates and can you count them? Now, uh, it's known that you can do that in certain n equals to 4, in, n, in certain n equals to uh, in, in, in certain uh, string theory models. And in this talk here, as I said, we'll be dealing with four-dimensional asymptotically flat GPS black holes arising in n equals to four hydrotic string theory. And well, in this, in this context, it's known that you, at least at weak string coupling, that you can represent the black hole in terms of uh, of a bunch of uh, brains and, and strings, and then you can count their excitations. This picture here will not be relevant for us. We'll simply be assuming that we have a, um, a way of counting the microstates of these um, four dimensional uh, DPS black holes in these hypothetic theories. And for these theories, it will turn out that the number of microstates of these DPS black holes is encoded or determined in terms of three integers in an L. And given these three integers, you can construct this quantity delta. And for this to be the number of microstates associated to a single center black hole, you require delta to be positive. And then, um, it, uh, assuming that, that you have some knowledge about the number of microstates, if you take the log and uh, if you evaluate a large MNL, then this log of this number will turn out to be square root of delta, and this should then correspond to the first term in the sequence here, uh, namely to the area uh, of the event horizon. But of course, uh, this will have all kinds of subleading corrections, and just to connect these dots here, which you encounter on the microstate counting side with these coefficients up here, well, for any of four hydrotic black holes, you will find that there is no logarithmic area correction. But all these other coefficients are not vanishing, so you generate all kinds of corrections, and this is what we would like to understand. So, uh, can I ask a tiny version? This is my ignorance of this, but uh, if you really count the number of states in the full field in the these charges, first, the first question is should it be the infinity in flat space just because there's an IR divergence? So, will you see the infinity and how will we remove that? That's. Uh, well, um, as opposed to ADS, where you know we don't worry about this because well, um, <clears throat> well, I, I, well, what can I say? Uh, what the temperature? Just the volume. Yes, but just yeah. the volume. Just the fact that the black hole can can be very yeah, but, 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 but hold on. Oh, so just the zero be, modes. Just the zero modes is one. Yeah, but, but those are being definitely being taken yeah. out. Yeah. You you did take them out. Right? Yeah. That's one thing, and the other one is that this counting is done at weak string coupling, so it's not done in the gravitational phase. Right, but even then, there should be because there should be those many states of the theory, right, corresponding to the black hole being in different spots. Uh, and so, but 
you say you need to remove that. Right? That's right. right. But the second question yeah. is, if you, if you believe some weak gravity conjecture, then in principle, this black hole, can, there are other states which have, which have the same charges, which have, if this black hole can decay, presumably. Right? Because That's right. I'll come to that one. I see. And but those states yeah. will have a higher entropy than this black hole, isn't that so? No, no. So these other states, well, because the black hole decays into a whole bunch of constituent particles, which by the weak gravity conjecture must exist, and then just all of those particles have a volume to move around in, and so they have a. The weak gravity volume. conjecture seem to think that these black holes can decay, and well, they can't, they are zero temperature. They can be zero temperature, but they can still decay because you, you still have to have. Okay, and so not, not by Hawking radiation, but there's, there, there have to be some states which have charge larger than mass, right? And so that's why that's how they can not. It's true that that argument is usually being given for the gravity conjecture. That's just completely bogus. I mean, historically, that argument was given, and I think it's completely agreed, even by the people who did it, that it doesn't actually make sense. It doesn't mean that the gravity conjecture is wrong. Just, but, but that argument. But if such states exist, then why can't they? They them? don't. This so cannot decay. It's absolutely so stable. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I'll come yeah. to that now okay. on the next slide. So to, here's a summary then about the black holes we are going to look at. As I said, we'll be dealing with uh, heterotic string theory, compact to 5 out of 6 torus. You could also do this uh, for other n equals to 4 uh, models, such as CHL models, but here we'll confine ourselves to heterotic string theory of the 6 torus. We'll be interested in dionic black holes, so these are going to correspond to a quarter DPS black holes. They're going to be supersymmetric, asymptotically flat. Let me remark, and we'll be interested in single center black holes. These black holes will be at zero temperature, and they will be single center. Let me then remind you that the horizon geometry is given by AES2 times X2, and this AES2 will then later play an important role. As I said, they're dionics, so uh, they carry electric and magnetic charges, and well, these theories have a bunch of Maxwell fields. So accordingly, you have a bunch of charges uh, denoted here by QI for the electric ones, PI for the magnetic ones, and given these charges, you can construct three bilinears, which will correspond to these three MNLs, oops, MNLs which I gave you there. So M will be the magnetic bilinear, and the electric one, L will be Q dot P. And then finally, let me remind you of the fact that these uh, solutions um, are supported by complex scalar fields. They have a non-trivial profile, but as you approach the near horizon region, the entire solution, and hence also the scalar fields, they become determined in terms of the charges carried by the black hole, and this means that the entire solution in this regime here, in this near horizon geometry, is determined by the charges, and therefore the entropy will be given in terms of the charges of the black hole. Oops. Now, there are three approaches to, um, I'll, I'll come back to your question uh, much later. There are three approaches to DPS black hole entropy. The first one is the, uh, is the microscopic uh, state counting approach, rooted in number theory, and that's, interestingly speaking, the best understood one. And uh, this is so because the number of, of uh, black hole microstates for these single center black holes, and again, we'll be interested in single center black holes. Later, we'll also encounter bound states of black holes. They will play an indirect role, but we are interested in the microstates of single center black holes. They turn out to be uh, given in terms of Fourier coefficients of meromorphic single model forms. And it turns out, and this is what we did recently, year ago, more or less, it turns out that you can have, write down an exact expression for these um, single center um, uh, black hole microstates, and this is given in terms of what is called a Radermacher or Radermacher type expansion. And I'll tell you later what the Radermacher type expansion is. So this is the best understood approach. Another approach would be to try to uh, compute the number of black hole microstates from a quantum gravity uh, patentable perspective. This is more complicated. Now, Shopsen has come up with a proposal for this, uh, for the kind of quantum gravity patent who one should be looking at. It's called the quantum entropy function. And the thing you should remember is that uh, in this 
quantum gravity patent rule, we are instructed to sum over space-time geometries, let's say over all space-time geometries, that asymptote to <coughs> this product geometry A S2 times S2, which characterizes the linear rising geometry of the black hole. And this is done in a Euclidean space-time way. Now, this quantum gravity, this quantum, this quantum entropy function, well, it should reproduce the number theoretic expression. On the other hand, for large charges, it will have the leading behavior given by the area law of the Bekin's time and Hawking. There is this ADS2 factor here in the game, so you may then uh, also ask whether there's a holographic approach that is that, that could somehow reproduce or talk to the number of black hole microstates of these black holes. So there shouldn't be a holographic uh, dual model to ADS2. Let's call it the control on the mechanics model. And you may wonder whether you can uh, recover aspects of these numbers of black hole microstates from considerations in, in this conformal quantum mechanics model. And there's an old quantum conformal quantum mechanics model called uh, the D alpha Fourier Fermat model, um, to which I will come back at the very end for uh, two seconds. So these are three possible approaches to trying to uh, get to the DPS black hole entropy. The first one uh, is the best understood one, and that's the one I'll start with. And then I'll try to infer lessons from the exact expression we'll be generating here to understand how to actually formulate this quantum entropy function with precision. And then finally, I'll say a few words here about the uh, hol holographic model. Oops. So let me begin with the number theoretic approach. Again, we are dealing with the hot extreme theory on, theory on the six torus, and we want to count the number of uh, the, the, the microstate degeneracies of single center a quarter BTS black holes. Now, there's an old conjecture by Dijkraaf, Verlinde, and Verlinde, which is now 26 years old, uh, which says that the microstates of the single center a quarter BTS black holes in this hypothetic theory are captured by are given in terms of the Fourier coefficients of um, a single modular form um, called phi 10, or rather it's the inverse of phi 10, and phi 10 carries a name, it's called the Boozer cusp form. I'll remind you in a second of what the single modular form is. Now this is an object, so one more phi 10 is an object that depends on three complex parameters, rho, sigma, d, and therefore um, you have to do three contour integrations to extract the Fourier coefficient, d, which uh, is then going to give you the number of black hole microstates. But there's a problem here in that one or phi 10 is meromorphic. So if you choose a contour to and do a contour C and you perform this triple contour interval, if you now start sliding up and down with the uh, contour, as soon as you cross a pole, you'll pick up a residue and the Fourier coefficient will jump. So you have to be very careful in selecting the contour. Um, and as a matter of fact, you have to select it in such a way that you really just capture microstates of single center black holes. In a second, I will tell you that one or one or five ten also, carries, also captures multi, uh, uh, two center uh, black hole bound states. So let us be very careful. Now, there is this quantity delta here. Delta, so, so, so the Fourier coefficients are uh, given in terms of M and L, integers M and L. You can then construct this quantity delta, 40 mn minus L squared. So given the Fourier coefficient, this delta could be either positive, zero, or negative. Zero, if delta is zero, these Fourier coefficients will not play a role in this talk, so I'll simply omit them. But the other ones are either positive or they are negative. <coughs> so those that are positive, those Fourier coefficients that are positive, according to a short sum, um, are associated or captured the degeneracies of these single center black holes, and these are the ones we are interested in. The Fourier coefficients that are negative, they capture the microstates of two center uh, black hole bound states. We are not interested in them, but in the final formula, they will show up uh, pretty uh, interestingly. So, what the upshot of this is that we then have to select the contour C in such a way that we only um, end up uh, capturing single center degeneracies. 
which are the, uh, the genesis without the puzzle. Now let me first remind you about the SQL module for this. So again, yeah. yeah. so, I believe you said the single set of libraries or can you have multi set of libraries? Uh, one or five ten. So here we are talking about one or five ten, and that only can capture, capture single and um, two set of uh, black hole stacks. It also carries delta equals to zero stacks, but let's ignore that. You could have multiple center uh, black hole stacks, but they are not captured by one or five ten, so that's not. Not going to be a relevant so question. Maybe this is the answer to the question I was asking as well, because if this black hole splits up into many things, that is the kind of thing that I was about. True. And so, and so somehow that's being excluded. That's being excluded by working well on the fact that. So, so, yeah. uh, so this is an old index I showed. I mean, so that's somehow doing something very clever, right? Because there are all these states in the theory that have the same charges. Yes. But somehow 10 is focusing on exactly what you Module the two center long stacks, but they will come in sneakily. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you later. So, let me remind you of what the single module form is. So, here we are uh, living on the single upper half plane, that's a generalization of the usual complex upper half plane. The single uh, upper half plane is defined in the following way we uh, work with matrices 2 times 2 that are symmetric, which is to say that they are parameterized in terms of three complex parameters, rho, sigma, v. So think of this roughly as being a C3. Then, then there was also a condition uh, on the imaginary part of lambda, so uh, the diagonals have to have positive imaginary part, and then there's also a condition on the determinant of M of lambda. Then there is a single module group operating on this upper half plane. It's given by SP4. These are four times four matrices decomposed in two blocks, like so, subject to a certain construct. And, uh, the, and, 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 and you move in the single upper half plane from one point rho sigma v to some other point by this fractional linear transformation. That's what you are instructed to do. And then finally, a single modular form of weight k, let's take k to be an integer, a positive integer, is a holomorphic function defined on the upper half single plane such that when you apply a modular transformation to it, it goes back to itself times this automorphic factor of weight k. And here for us, k will be 10, and we'll be dealing with a single modular form of weight 10. All right, this was a single modular form in a nutshell. But now I told you that 1 or 5 10, which is the object whose Fourier coefficients you have to. Yeah. Is there a geometric uh, interpretation of this uh, action, SP4Z? A uh, geometric interpretation. I mean, uh, the way we understand SL2 Z invariance is just a partition function of the torus, and then it should that, be as a large gauge, uh, large gauge function. That, that is true, yeah. So yeah there's that, yes. Is that what you're asking? Yes, on, yeah. what, on, what, on what manifold? Genus 2. Genus 2. Right. Yeah. So is it just a modular type form on genus 2, sir? That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And why is genus 2 relevant here? Sorry to ask okay. this basic question. Right. Uh, let me. Postpone that question okay. when we come to the bound states, okay? Yeah. But roughly, 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 were you to uh, uh, squeeze the genus 2 surface, yeah. split it into two separate tori, then what this would amount to is that you are splitting a dion into an electric and a magnetic constituent. The degeneracy, the perturbative degeneracies <coughs> of each of them is captured by data in 108 to 24. And so what, what this genus 2 is doing is it's merging this information, but I'll come back to that later. So there's an intuition behind it. Yeah. That's one comment. The other one is that this contains S block T variants. So there is one SL, there's a strong recoupling duality, symmetry of heterotic string theory embedded into this SP for Z. That's the other one. Uh, but I'll come back to the splitting picture later and it's related to Suvrat's question. So here comes one important thing. So 1 or 5 10 has poles. These poles are labeled by five integers. We, uh, they are called uh, M1, M2, J, M1, M2. The only thing you need to remember is that M2 is positive or zero. Now, you're in the upper half single plane that is parameterized by three complex parameters, rho, sigma, v, so that's a C3. In that C3, you have poles, they are characterized by this hypersurface written there, 
and this hypersurface depends on these five integers. Now, it turns out that these five integers can be parameterized in terms of two distinct sl 2 zs sitting in SP4. Here is the dictionary parameterizing the five integers in terms of these Greek and Latin sl 2 zs So there are two sl 2 zs in Greeks and Latin. You will not need to know any of the details. The only thing you should remember is that there are going to be two SL2Zs in the game. The Rademacher, how shall I say this, um, technique requires one SL2Z. It's going to be, we'll have two SL2Zs in the game. Okay, so keep that in mind. The other thing you need to notice is that when, if you look at the locus here of these zeros in the upper half plane, there are terms that are quadratic in the in the coordinates of your single upper half plane, and turns out how many. The ones that are quadratic go with M2 positive, so we call them the quadratic poles. The ones that are linear, uh, well, they go with M2 equals to zero, so N equals to zero, we call them the linear poles. Now, a short sign has shown that the linear poles are associated <laughs> with the decay of these two center bound states, which I briefly alluded to earlier, across walls of margin stability. We are not interested in, in these two center bound states and their decays. We are really only interested in the single center black hole uh, microstates. So we will be only considering um, the poles with M2 positive. Okay? Nevertheless, so then, here is the idea. We have to do three contour integrations, and the idea is that we want to set up the thing in such a way that we really just capture the single center microstates with no further pollution coming from two microstate degeneracies or two center bound states. So you have to choose the contour very carefully. You have to do three integrals, starting with the row integral. This is now a postulate. We postulate, and that will drive everything. We postulate that the first contour integral will be done as a sum over, resi over the residues associated with the quadratic pole, with the quadratic poles, the poles with M2 positive located in the single upper half plane, and it will drive the whole story. So we have to calculate these residues now. How do we do that? Actually, we now, for technical reasons, we will map we, we map these quadratic poles to one particular linear pole. This is done for technical reasons. I'm not saying that we are now bringing in, that we are now counting microstate degeneracies associated with linear poles. For technical reasons, and it comes back to the two questions that were asked, we are going to map the quadratic poles, which are associated with the single center degeneracies, to one very specific linear pole. Why? Because at that the very specific linear pole, in the vicinity of this very specific linear pole, we know what 1 over phi 10 looks like, and that's what we need to evaluate the residues. And this now goes back to Suvrat's and Abhijit's question. At this linear pole, V prime equals to zero, it's a very special linear pole. Well, you see that indeed there's a pole given that is of second order here, 1 over V prime times 1 over e to 24 times 1 over e to 24. And this corresponds to taking a genus 2 uh, surface, squashing, no, splitting it, splitting it into two separate things, and uh, assigning to each of the tori a degeneracy given by 1 over e to 24, which corresponds roughly to what you expect for the perturbative, which is what you get for the, for the the genesis of the perturbative states in the tropic stream. So that's the intuition behind, that was part of the intuition behind the proposal by Dijk, Rapper, and Berlin. All right. Now, how do we actually map any such quadratic pole? Sorry, choosing to do the row integral first, is yeah. that uh, a choice? Or like, would it be the same if you do the sigma integral first? Uh, then you do it would have been the same. It would have been the same. So, so they're symmetric, these three equations. Just choose one. That is right. That is right. So again, we are doing, we are going to sum of the residues over the quadratic poles, but for technical reasons, we use these two SL2Zs, which I gave you earlier, to map a quadratic pole 
in coordinates rho sigma v to a linear pole in coordinates rho prime sigma v prime. This linear pole has to be in the upper half single play, which means that the measure part of rho prime and measure part of sigma prime have to be positive, and then we drive the whole thing. But, but this is not to say that this is totally trivial. Uh, there are lots of subtleties here, and this now tries to summarize the subtleties which you encounter when you play this game. So as I said, the first integration, one over rho, is done by summing over the residues associated with the quadratic poles. One over all. Then you have to do the second integral. This is, sorry, the integral over v. Now remember, we map everything to the linear pole v prime equals to zero. For this pole to be the upper half single plane, you have to ensure that m of rho prime, m of single prime are not bigger than zero. And this puts restrictions on the contour of the v-integral. I can't, I don't have the time to explain this, but there are the natural restrictions for the contour of the second inter contour integral that appear. So if the row integral has been done, right? The row one. The row one has been done. Yeah, now, now I need the v one. So, but still talk about rho prime. To, no, I'm step, step two here. Okay. So, no, but uh, you still talk about rho prime as sigma prime as free variables? Oh yeah, um, these are the transform variables. So you have to, so we are doing the calculation in the original variables, but for technical reasons, mapping it <coughs> to these variables. Okay. Then you have to, then you have these conditions in these transform variables, but now you have to see what this means in the original variables. Okay. And you find that the integration control for V has to be on a very specific form. Okay. I can't, due to lack of time, can't explain this. So then you get a definite v a contour integral, and if you evaluate it, you get error functions. And amazingly enough, in these error functions, if you then uh, evaluate them and you look at what they contribute, you will find that there is a continued fraction structure encoded in them. I'll come to that at the very end. This is just a remark on passant. And then third, you have to do the sigma integration. <clears throat> the sigma integration is the most interesting one. The sigma integration is the one that is going to relate the stuff to rather macro type expansions. You see, the sigma contour now, remember, you, 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 you are taking into account the locus of quadratic poles. So the, the last integration contour of a sigma has to cross this locus of quadratic and once you analyze what this means, you find that the sigma contour integral is given in terms of a union over fourth circles. Now, you may not quite know what that is, so let me explain what that is. But it's this ingredient that you have a union over infinitely many fourth circles that will allow you to get an exact expression for the microstate degeneracy, and this has to do with the rather macher choice of contour. So let me try to explain this now. So what is a fourth circle to begin with? So suppose you are in the sig sigma upper half plane. And a fourth circle, uh, very roughly, is a circle in the sigma upper half plane that is tangent to the real axis. And it, it touches the real axis at the rational point. So it's anchored at the rational point. Now, what is the Radermacher contour? So suppose I give you a modular function in the single upper half plane, you want to integrate, if you say, from i to i plus 1 along a horizontal segment. This integral in general will be totally hopeless to do. So what Radermacher in the 30s realized, also based on work, previous work by Ramanujan and Hardy, was to actually deform this integration contour. So instead of integrating along a horizontal line from there to there, you deform the contour into a, a union of upper arcs. In the upper arcs are upper arcs of fourth circles. So here you have three fourth circles um, anchored at these rational points, one third, one half, and two thirds. So you deform the contour like so. You take the upper arcs, whatever upper arc now means, and, and then you get a rather upper contour with, based on three fourth circles. Now imagine that you keep in squeezing fourth circles underneath this guy here and that guy here. So you keep adding little, little, little 
smaller and smaller and smaller Ford circles, in which case you end up having infinitely many Ford circles. What happens to these upper arcs? You see, as you squeeze more and more in, the upper arcs start moving down. So in the limit of n going to infinity, the upper arc is actually the full fourth circle, or, or rather the full circle with, with the anchoring point removed, and that drives the magic. So, so, so this is the main ingredient you really need to, to, to be able to obtain an exact expression. So then, let me give you a classic example, and then let me give you the result we found, which is a generalization of this classic example based on the upper half complex plane to a, a generalization to a single upper half plane. So let's look at e, a the eta function. And here it is. Let's look at 24 copies. Here it is. Let's look at 1 over 24. It's meromorphic. But, uh, let, let's look at it defined on the upper half complex plane. And let's fully expand it. And now suppose you would like to compute the Fourier coefficients, d of n. Now, the thing to notice is that m here starts at minus 1. So there is one m, there is one Fourier coefficient that has a negative m. Fourier coefficients with negative m's sorry, are called polar coefficients. That's important. And for this simple example, there's only one of them. And d minus 1 is known as 1. So suppose now you want to calculate the Fourier coefficient with m positive with precision. So you would write down an integral like so. You would uh, integrate in the upper half complex plane along the horizontal segment from z to z plus 1. And then you are doomed. You would not know what to do. Now comes along Rademacher, who says, no, 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 replace the uh, path, the horizontal strip, by uh, a Rademacher contour, by this thing here. Then you are in business. You need. What do you need to do that? You need to have four circles, because that's what defines your Radamacher path. And you need to have a, a, a modular transformation, an SL2Z at your disposal. If you have both ingredients, then, then you obtain the following formula for the free coefficients with n positive, given by this expression. And this expression uses four ingredients, four. It uses the polar coefficient. These are the three coefficients with negative n, and there's only one of them. It uses a sum over the over c. C is one of these SL to Z parameters. You need one SL to Z. It uses Bessel functions here of mm -hmm. index 13, uh, and these are Bessel functions of, 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 of um, first kind. And it uses Klusterman sums, classical Klusterman sums, which are sums of phases, four ingredients. And to obtain that, you need, as I said, one SL to Z and four circles. So that's the classical result. Kevin, yeah. in this sum, each sum, should I think of them as being associated to various parts? Correct. To, to, to various parts of this contour? Exactly, to, 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 to the individual four circles. It is. So this is the leading one, then that one, then exactly. that one. Yeah. So now, coming back to our Siegel modular story. So we are now on the Siegel upper half plane with three contour integrals, two SL2Zs. We did the first two contour integrals, the rho and v. The last one, the sigma, turned out to be given in terms of a union over four circles. We have two SL2Zs, we are in business. And so this is then the exact expression you find for the black hole microstates of single center black holes in, uh, in according to EPS black holes in the cyclotic release. There are four lines here. The first line is the counterpart of what I just told you. The other three lines are, they don't have a classical count, they don't have a counterpart, they have something to do with mock modularity. All right. Let's focus on the first one. So these are the Fourier coefficients of 1 over phi 10 with positive delta. So these are the Fourier coefficients of that give you the number of black hole microstates of single center black holes. And they are given in terms of the four ingredients I, I told you, uh, I just gave you, namely, there's a sum over gamma here. Gamma is one of the entries of the Greek SL2Z. So this is one SL2Z. Then there are these coefficients here and there. 
these are the polar coefficients, that is to say the Fourier coefficients of 1 over phi 10 with negative alpha. Then there are the generalized Pustamann sums, I'm not going to tell you what they are, they are compli more complicated than classical ones. And then there are these special functions now of index 23 halves uh, of first kind. These are the four ingredients, and they are the analog, roughly, of uh, what you have here in this classical expression due to Ramacher. Now, before I go on to these other lines, now coming back to your question, these polar coefficients, so these are the full coefficients of 1 over phi 10 with negative delta. So according to Ashok Sam, they capture the microstate degeneracies of two center bound states. So we should see that now here. And indeed, here is the formula for the polar coefficients of 1 over phi 10. They indeed, well, they are given in terms of sub over Latin. So this is the second SL2Z that is appearing. The first SL2Z gives you the analog of the classical Robert Macher sum. The second SL2Z, the Latin one, gives you detailed knowledge about the polar coefficients uh, of 1 over phi 10. And what you see here is exactly, ah, oh, you can't see that. Ah, this was a two center thing here. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, it's a very, oh. <laughs> right, so, so this picture which you cannot see represented a bound state of two black holes. So there are two centers here. Each of these centers has comes with its microstate degeneracy encoded in 1 over 24. And then there's electric magnetic binding energy that holds these two things together. So the polar coefficients um, capture the um, microstate the polar coefficients are given in terms of sums over microstate degeneracies of two center black hole bound states, first. Second, I'll come to what this sum means in a second. <laughs> this sum involves a second SL2Z. Third, you see that the microstate degeneracy of single center black holes, this is a non perturbative dynamic object, turns out to be encoded in the perturbative degeneracies through this Rademacher extension, which is pretty remarkable in this very complicated manner. Now, so, sorry, I, I yeah. forgot. Uh, can you remind us or remind me of what gamma is? Gamma was one, one of the SL2Z, the one of the, the, one of the yeah, which is related with the other parameters. Is that correct? Yeah. So sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's the analog. Gamma is the analog. Gamma is the analog of this one, of the C. Okay, so it's one of the parameters that you have used in the SO2 to, to bring... That's to right, yeah, yeah. Point there were two SO2 the sets there, the Greeks and the Latins, okay. and this is one of them. And you are summing over all possible values. That That's right. That's right. Okay. I'm sure the minus 1 could be L plus 1 in the beginning, but it, what does it mean? Because it should be positive, right? Right, uh, the degeneracy is positive. Um, Right, um, right, um, oops, <laughs> right, right, so the genesis are positive, it's not obvious from this formula that they are positive, but this minus one to the L plus one is crucial for that, but it's not obvious at all, there are lots of things that are not obvious about this formula, you could for instance ask about s duality. Is this manifestly invariant and the rest quality and the strong weak coupling exchange where you interchange the magnetic bilinear uh, and the electric bilinear? It's highly non obvious. Oh, so integrality then? Integrality is another thing. Oh, yeah, right. Integrality is another thing. Yeah, let me make a few comments now. A few comments. So, first of all, well, now that you asked that, I made the earlier statement that we. I said that all of this is driven by the first contour interval of a row where we chose or we said that we define it to be given to the sum of a residues uh, associated with the n to bigger than zero poles. You could question that. You could ask, well, okay, you got the symmetric formula, but how do we actually now know that you got the right thing? 
your question is another one uh, about integra integrality. You can check this numerically. Mm. Uh, you can, at least for low lying mm. MNLs, compute the first uh, fully equipped fish to 1 out of 510, mm. and then check against this beast. You, so you can do certain checks, but, but you're right. Uh, that, that also is something that needs to be proven or should be proven in general. Let me make another comment here. So I told you that these polar coefficients are given in terms of sums, Latin sums, over microstate degeneracies of two center bound states. But what exactly are we summing over here? Well, we are summing over the, what this sum represents is a set of decay walls across which um, the two bound state systems can decay. And the set of walls which appear in the sum are characterized or determined in terms of the continued fraction of L tilde divided by 2L. And this came out of these error functions that, uh, that we encountered when we did the second V integral. Okay? Now, I don't have time to explain any of this, but all of this to say that this here represents um, um, uh, a set of domain walls, sorry, a set of uh, walls of larger stability across which these two center bound states decay and disappear from the spectrum. And which set of domain of, of um, walls of larger stability you pick, well, that is it, as I said, encoded in this continued fraction structure that emerges from the error functions. Okay? So this is a very neat structure that emerges here. Now, ah, now, how do we know that this is actually correct? Well, there are these three additional lines here that don't have a classical Radomacher counterpart. They involve different vessels, I-12. They involve a nice low interval over I-25 halves. So what is all of this? Well, so I can ask a question yes. about two sentence black ones again. So there is no modular in these solutions. There's no modular that allows you to decrease the energy of each and separate them more. The, the distance is just fixed. In these are really bound states, I can't separate them. No, no, as you as you go to the walls of much stability, they, they, they will they will I see. Right. But if I'm away from that, then I, I don't I I can't they're That's bound. Right. Yes. Now, so how do we know that this is correct? Well, in this magnificent paper here by the whole Carmonti Sadier, again, I don't have time to go into this, but let me just give you the story. What, they, what you can do is you can take one of the and fully expand it in one of the module line, in one of the parameters row, in which case the functions you pick up here will be fully Jacobi functions, forms, um, that depend on C and V. You can then further decompose these so these fully Jacobi things have good modular properties, but you can decompose them into a finite part and a polar part. And when you do this decomposition, it turns out that the finite and the polar part separately are not modular anymore, they are not modular. And now there's an argument here which says that the microstate degeneracies of single center black holes can also be computed from the fully coefficients of the finite part of psion. Therefore, it's of interest to calculate, to take the finite part of Psyam, calculate its free coefficients, and see what you get. And this is what Ferrari and Rice did a while ago. And the expression they got is exactly this, with one difference. Namely, they couldn't access the detailed structure um, of the polar coefficients. So we reproduced that on the nose, and in addition got the detailed structure about the, um, about the polar coefficients, which was, not, which was not accessible in their approach. So just to summarize what we have done so far, and then I'll switch here and go over to the quantum entropy function. So I gave you a majestic formula with lots of terms. You may ask, hmm, I mean, how, how there are, million, there are infinitely many terms here. Which of these terms gives you the leading area law, right? It's going to be the first term, gamma equals to one, then there is going to be an n tilde equals to minus one, and then there's going to be 
uh, and now tell vehicles to M that gives you the area model. Uh, summarizing what you needed for all of this, well, uh, there was the input that we summed over the residues of the quadratic poles of our North Phi 10 only. There were two SL2Zs in the game, there were four circles in the game. Um, remarkably, one finds that the diodic degeneracies are encoded in the perturbative degeneracies through these polar coefficients representing microstates of bound state systems. There are exponentially suppressed corrections. You see each of these vessels, you have infinitely many vessels here, all down by one over gamma. A vessel to leading order goes like the exponential of the argument. So you have infinite, you have a sum here over infinitely many exponentials. So you have infinitely many uh, exponentially suppressed corrections. And finally, as I said, these additional three lines you see, well, they have to do with the mock modular behavior of one over phi ten, but I can't go into that. So we have to switch gear now. So this was the rather macro picture. Um, we started from one over phi ten did three contour integrations, obtained a rather macro type expression, an exact expression. Now it turns out that, oh, oh. I forgot, this slide, that was a summary at the very, end. oh boy. So now let me toss in the slide. I, 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 this was a very important slide. <laughs> I'm very sorry for that. So sorry, sorry, sorry. So, so what I have done now was I, I did this Radebacher expansion argument. Now I'm going to still on the microscopic side go over to the covariant picture, and then I'm going to start doing quantum gravity uh, uh, patentable stuff, and eventually end up here in some holographic model, uh, and and maybe I'll I'll, I'll connect to this uh, later. Oh boy, I, I, I'm very sorry for that. All right, so now, let's go over to the covariant picture. So again, we start with 1 over phi 10. We do the row into row by summing over residues. You get what you get. Now we add a total derivative term to the, to the integrand. We are still left with two integrations, sigma and v. Let's change variables and now call them tau 1 and tau 2. Well, the total relative term is such that it vanishes on this integration contour over sigma v, or now if you want, over tau 1, tau 2. And then, the uh, expression you are left with starts looking very differently. So, you still, you have a, you, you still have to do two contour integrals over sigma and v. You know exactly what the contour looks like. It translates into a certain contour in, in the tau 1, tau 2 plane. But the, the function you're integrating over is very interesting. You see, it, it takes a very simple form. And it's given, it, it has three ingredients. It has the blue ingredients in the exponent. There's a phase phi here, and there's this exponent, given in terms of the charge by linears M and L, and tau 1, and tau 2. The same expression shows up here as a measure, plus a 26. And then in red, there is this uh, eta 24 ingredient, evaluated at funny combinations of tau 1 and tau 2. So rho star prime, for instance, is this combination here in terms of tau 1, tau 2, and the Latin entries. And there will be a similar combination uh, for sigma star prime. All right, now this we call the covariant picture. Why? Because in this picture, S quality is more manifest. Not all of it, but for instance, the T generator of S quality, namely Wittenschaft, you take the electric charge, you shift Q into Q plus P, Wittenschaft, that is not manifest. Uh, that's the T generator of SL2Z. Um, the magnetic bilinear is invariant, the electric one shifts into stuff. And, 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 well, and the expression I gave you before turns out to be, oops, yeah, that falls off there. You see? It jumps. It jumps. It jumps. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, and, 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 and therefore we call this the covariant picture just to separate it from the boundary <coughs> picture. But now I want to go to this point in total derivative. Exactly. Which, however, which vanishes on the integration component. That's very crucial. So the expressions are strictly the same. It's just that they are now at this intermediate stage, having done one contour interval, they look different. And now the macroscopic interpretation will. So now you have a rather microscopic expression, you have this covariant picture expression, you want to macroscopically interpret both of them. And since they look so different, the interpretation will look different. The technical are the same. The IR, that's right. So now the, the, the second approach to VPS by coentropy, the pathogens will in a nutshell. So you now have to, you, you are instructed by Shok Sam to define a very particular quantum gravity pattern to work called the quantum entropy function. This is a nifty object uh, in which you are instructed to take all the fields in string theory. Um, sorry, you, you, you are instructed to consider a functional integral over all fields in string theory in a certain Euclidean background, and this background cannot be anything. It has to asymptote to uh, Euclidean ABS2 times S2, um, fixed by the attractor mechanism, whatever that means. And then you are instructed to do this for each of these backgrounds and sum over everything. Now the backgrounds are supported by abelian edge potentials and by constant complex scalar fuels. And then through supersymmetric localization uh, by the Volca, Gormish, and Murti, you are told that this functional integral, which I feel is horrible, localizes to a finite dimensional Riemannian integral. So you then integrate over a set of coordinates, phi, and these turn out to be the real parts of these constant complex scalar fields. All right, just in a nutshell. Okay, so again, yes. so again, the other question. So the, the story here was that you were in the economical and the microeconomical ensemble, right? And I'm sure you get the right boundary condition. Yes. Right, but you're doing something at a very high level of precision uh, it goes beyond this microcanonical because microcanonical just means spread in energy is small. But you're really counting how many states that have a given energy. I mean, but do we know that this part integral is going to be as precise enough, or we just find the empirical art check that it will be precise? Right. I, uh, I, I guess. Yeah. I, I can. Well. Um, right. Um, that's a good question. Um, Why don't they have all uh, the same energy? So, Why do I mean, the question is, can you count the, the, the entropy you count it in the canonical or the microcanonical ensemble? Microcanonical? Yes, but when you count the microcanonical, you know, that uh, usually when you say in statistical mechanics, microcanonical, you're not, you're not counting exact energy eigenstates. But here we are, because there's a gap. Yes, here we are. <coughs> the question is, if, if it's clear that the path integral is going to give us that entropy, or if it, if it just happens to match. Well, um, what can I say? So Shoksen has shown that this reproduces semi-classical results based on all entropy. It uh, reproduces um, the OSV conjecture in the sense that the results you get from this uh, quantum entropy function um, have uh, factorization property, reminiscent of what OSV had. Beyond that, I think, I'd say it's a belief, yeah. I see. So the fact that it works out so nicely is, is nice. It, it, it didn't happen. I mean, the more entropy you would have got without getting all these integer DLCs and so on. But I think in the recent paper by Inishu and uh, Toriachi and Murphy is exactly doing this a little bit above the BPS and find exactly zero. They show that this really is a delta function in energy space, and there's a gap. And I okay. thought that was a very precise computation. I mean, maybe there's some, okay. maybe something you can complain about, but it's not like there's nothing. It was quite a precise argument. It is quite a precise argument, except for the issue of the measure. <laughs> but okay, but. But I think Sugat is asking whether there is an a priori proof that they both have to be identical. I 
guess that's what you want to ask. Yeah. Well, we... okay. Now, now coming back to what you just said, Finn. Um, so, so now you have to do the same integral here. You, you have to do this complementary function integral, and there are various ingredients that go into it. Into it. First one is the choice of the integration contour. The second one is which what measure are you going to put in there? Now, there is no first principle understanding of the measure that goes in there. There's an approximate understanding of what the measure should look like. And you use that approximate understanding based on symplectic covariance, pa -ta -ti -pa -ta -ta, to perform calculations here and then to and then to compare with the exact microstate counting result that you got. And in doing so, you are led to correct the measure that you started with. That you, you, you are led to correct the approximate measure that you started with from, and I think the same applies to Turiachi et al, to write down a measure that does the job. But the point being that there is no a priori understanding of uh, what the measure really should look like. And what you find is that, well, but if you do that, if you work with this approximate measure, you sort of end up in the random architecture of things. And, and therefore, what this means is, as follow, it is the following. Since this localization thing brings you to the random architecture, what this means is that the information about the bound state, microstate degeneracies, which were in code, which were in these polar coefficients, the information about these polar coefficients is now tucked into the mesh. Okay. So, so in this quantum entropy function business, which which brings you to the Ranma expansion, the knowledge about these uh, polar coefficients is hidden in, in the mesh. Uh, so, so, so of the area. quantum entropy function. Oh, no, that, that, that's precisely what I wanted to ask. Sorry for my ignorance. You were talking about measure, measure... Of the quantum well, entropy function. The quantum yeah, I'm talking about the quantum path interval. Yeah. You're instructed to... So you don't know the idea to... of the state, in some sense. It, 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 what information is that measure giving you physically, sorry? Or, or sorry, this <laughs> is a <laughs> question. Uh, 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 Well, um, well, what I'm trying to say is, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I can't answer that with precision. Yes, I only know the. Um, no, no, I'm answer it in the wrong way. So sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so you have a Riemannian interval here to do over these fields five. Yes, that, this that is. will come with a measure. Yeah. And you don't know it by first principle. Yeah, you don't know what it looks and like. There are some. You fix it by magic. To, to, to run a map. That's yeah, right. That's, that's right. That's right. And what you get by doing that matching is that the information on the polar term is, is yeah, precisely yeah. what gives you the measure. And that measure is what knows about the bound state. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. So, 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 so that is one message you should keep in mind. Um, in this rather macro picture, the knowledge about the bound states is in the measure. So is there a priori method to get this measure from the path integral? Like, what would you have to do uh, if, during the localization procedure to get this measure on the top? Is there some I have future done method that one? I have just done localization. Or there's just no idea of how to <coughs> I would not know, um, but I have done localization. Well, then you want to do localization and then get the final measure. Is, is that the direct procedure? I guess so, but I, uh, nobody has done it, so I would not know how to get it out of a localization uh, procedure, but maybe you know. I, I, I don't know. But that should be ultimately done, yeah. Right, so what I want to do is, I don't want to, I want to go, sorry, now coming back to the slide, so, so far I, I did this, I did that, I told you very briefly a few words about the thing, and I told you that somehow the information about the polar coefficients is hidden in the measuring on the quantum entropy function side, but now I want to go this way, what? 
Sorry. Does this mean that there are there exist multiple measures which give you different polar coefficients, keeping the integral integrality property? Mm. Mm. No. Um, let me see. I, 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 if you stay on this side here, then the uh, measure is uh, which you infer <coughs> by invoking the Radomacher expansion result is uniquely fixed. It's just that you don't know. From a purely quantum gravity point of view, how to argue for it? No, but when you say that the information about the measure is in the polar part, what does that mean? No, I meant the polar part is in the, the, the information about the polar coefficients is hidden in the oh, in, in the in, in the in the measure of the quantum pattern. Okay. By that I mean that in the quantum in the measure of path integral, I see a 1 over eta 24, a 1 over eta 24 <coughs> times an electric magnetic bound uh, yeah. uh, some electric magnetic binding. Yeah. I see that in there, in the measure. I see. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. But now I want to go down this way here. Now I go down this way. So I start in the current picture and now I want to interpret that from a macroscopic point of view. And this is where it becomes interesting. <laughs> so, right. So, I told you that there were three ingredients here in the covariant picture. So this is a this is a microscopic expression. And the question is, <laughs> what is a macroscopic uh, semi-classical interpretation of what you see here? So let's look at the exponentials. There is this. There, there are these tau ones and tau twos and these. Bilinears together with the phase. The phase depends on these um, M1s, M1s, M2s that characterize the location of the poles of one of the So, as a start, what you do is you do a semi classical, um, you do a set point analysis of what you have there, you extremize the exponent, you get an extremal uh, set point value for tau. That's given by the subtractive value. You plug it back into your exponent. You add the phase, which was the already exponent to it. And what you find is as follows. You find the area long plus a phase. The phase depends on these integers that characterize the poles of one of fact n. And the whole thing down by 1 over m2. So remember, we, we were summing over quadratic poles. They had m2 bigger than 0, starting with m2 equals to 1 and 3 equals to 2 and so forth. That's what you find, and now you can ask yourself, what's the macroscopic interpretation of that? And the macroscopic interpretation of that is that you are dealing with um, a set up with a space-time geometry. So the, the set point value I just gave you is going to be the entropy plus a phase associated to a door before of a year's The or before is with respect to M2. So here I've written down the line on an already S2 times S2. If M2 is 1, you don't have an orbit form, but once you orbit form the, the, the sphere and the ADS2, you get, you, you get things down here by 1 over M2. But then you want to make sure that there are no fixed points, so you have to supplement this with gauge potential shifts. And you can work this out with precision. I have not written down the, uh, the expressions. But you find, but, but you but you can write down these gauge potentials that are induced by the orbifold procedure with precision. They are given in terms of the charges by the black hole, in, in terms of these numbers that characterize the poles of one of them. And you can check that the resulting expressions are really as quality covariant as they should. So that means that you understand semi-classically the set of, uh, the, the the exponent the exponent appearing in this microscopic expression. Now let's look at the measure here, 26 plus that. Now you see this is the same combination as there. I just told you that this was the entropy associated with the Norby form of AS2 times S2. So what you have down here is the area law. Area law plus 26. So if you don't know anything about the measure, how would you argue, if you don't, since you don't have an a priori understanding of the measure you are supposed to put into these quantum gravity pattern intervals, how would you then guess such a measure? How would you argue for such a measure in a quantum gravity pattern interval? Well, here's what you can do. Um, so semi-classically, but on the saddle, this, as I said, is the area law. 
Now you know from a short sum uh, that there is no logarithmic area law correction to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy for these n equals to four black holes. So there's a zero there. Therefore, you have to have a measure here that goes like that. I don't know about the 26, but if the area is very big, the 26 is negligible, so let's ignore the 26. So it's natural to expect a measure here. Why? Well, if you exponentiate this, you get the log area term. But this will then get cancelled against the fluctuations around the saddle point, which also produce a lower end correction. And so you could argue uh, semi-classically that indeed uh, you expect to have a measure of the sort here. Now, so semi-classically then, you have, ex you have sort of explained this stuff here in the exponent, the measure, but what about the, the eta 24s? Now you see, there are two eta's here. You could think, ah, this is maybe a two-center uh, bound state type of information. But what is missing here is the electric magnetic binding of the two centers, which you had in the rather bottom picture, you don't have it here. So the question then is, what, how would you microscopically interpret this stuff now? Now, suppose you look at it from a two-dimensional point of view. So we are doing AS2 gravity. There are three things on the menu here. One would be um, bound, states, uh, bound states in AES2, but AES2 doesn't support bound states. Fragmented AES2 with real instantons, we don't see a sign of that. And Euclidean wormholes. So let's take n2 equals to 1. That's AES2 times S2. Let's look at it from a two-dimensional point of view. So what we want to do is we want to now explain or make a proposal for how we could interpret this here, these terms in red, from a two-dimensional point of view. The covariant picture gives us that, so what is macroscopic interpretation? When did I start? Seven thirty. Okay, so it's seven fine. It's okay. Fine. Right. So here's our proposal. So let's look at global ADS2. Oops, oh yeah. Let's look at global ADS2. Um, global ADS2, here it is. It's a strip. Um, it's a strip with two boundaries. Let's, it's supported by a constant two-dimensional deleton field. Here it is. Let's make the time-like direction T periodic. Let's, this is a proposal, so it's somewhat ad hoc. Let's make, uh, choose the periodicity of the time-like direction to be the, uh, the semi-classical value for how to star which we got here. In which case we now have a double chocolate. We made the, um, the boundary uh, periodic and we have a, a, an interval, so now we have a double trumpet. And on this double trumpet, let's now add 24 chiral and anti chiral periodic scalar fields. These, these are the, uh, this is the field content of critical bosonic strict theory, so there's no conformal anomaly here. Since we are dealing with ADS2 black holes, I have forgotten to say that uh, we are dealing with uh, time-independent configurations. So let's, um, let's, let's take the classically, let's look at the time-independent configuration for the scalar fields, which means that the associated matter T nu nu is zero, classically. But of course, it's well known that at the one loop, um, these periodic scalars um, produce precisely this combination which you see there in the uh, covariant uh, picture. Now at one loop there is a back reaction, uh, sorry, at one loop uh, T v nu will not any longer be, be zero. The matter T v nu will source the equation of motion for the deleton and this has been worked out by Victor Cote and Garcia Garcia. So you end up so the the, the, the T nu of the, of the 24 oops, of the 24 chiral fields back reacts on the dilaton to generate a non-trivial profile for the dilaton. 
And so what you can get is a trumpet that is supported by a non-trivial uh, dilaton. And this is now, has lately been interpreted as an Euclidean one solution. So, so, so this is then the proposal for macroscopically interpreting what one has here on this in this covariant picture which came up on number theory. Now Euclidean two-dimensional Euclidean wormholes is also what was proposed recently in these papers by Balasiano on supersymmetric black holes in ABS2. Their holographic description is related to one-dimensional Euclidean Liouville models. So finally, then, let me make a comment here about this holographic uh, direction here. So, so, the covariant picture, which, whose macroscopic interpretation he proposes based on two-dimensional Euclidean wormholes, gives you a holographic model based on the Euclidean one-dimensional Liouville action, or theory. The quantum entropy function, which uh, function which, which which was related to the Radamacher picture, well, that um, that um, is perhaps related to a Lorentzian uh, conformal quantum mechanics model. And so you can ask whether there is a relation between these two actions. And that's what you, what is here on the last slide. You can indeed work out the map that takes you from this one-dimensional Euclidean Lorentz, uh, Euclidean Liouville type action to this Lorentzian um, um, the Alfaro Fubini Furlan action with the opposite signs here as opposed uh, as opposite relative to the usual uh, DFF model. And, and this map involves a time differentialization uh, given by this alpha of T. And this is it. So this was a talk that was meant to be for two hours, but it had to be somewhat condensed. Um, and so I'll give you here for the sink. All right, thanks. Thank you. I missed the SL2Z sum in the covariant picture. What was that? Where was that coming from? Pardon? The SL2Z sum in the covariant picture. There's a sum over SL2Z. Uh, that. Oh, right. Well, you might explain it, but yeah, I right. guess, uh, yeah. I uh, so, so, so these were the two. Um, there were two. There were the Greek and the Latin SL two Zs that entered the game when performing the first integral of a row as a sum over residues. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's where it enters. No, but uh, in this, uh, from the gravity side, you were explaining all these terms that appear, that appear here, right? Ah. But now, what is the interpretation of some of S and Z from the gravity side? Right, so that's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have an answer for that. Uh, as a, you see, you see. So, so there are the Latins and the Greeks appearing in, in, in this expression for rho star prime and likewise for sigma star prime, which I didn't write down. These are very complicated expressions. They only become nice when you sort of take canonical values for the Greeks and the Latins, in which case this becomes simply tau 1 plus i tau 2, and the other one becomes tau 1 minus i tau 2. But in the presence of these Latins, we don't have a geometric understanding of this. Right, we don't understand this. And therefore, um, we don't really understand this from this, the, what the role of this is from, from a macroscopic point of view. It's obviously tied to S2 Albert T, but we don't understand it. With, with, uh, yeah, we, we don't really quite understand it. These are some two warm holes. These warm holes you're having, do they happen to come a uh, SO2 orbit of distinct wormholes, so that you have uh, different, uh, I mean, there's some saddle points here. And what right. uh, I, I, that's a good question. Um, they come, they come, uh, 
they are likely to come um, um, as a Greek Latin family of such objects. But since we haven't understood what this here means, uh, when the Greek and the Latins don't have canonical values, I can't really answer the question. But, they, but, but yeah, presumably. This one tangential kind of basic question. I mean, you had a very nice uh, review of this uh, Rademacher uh, contour, yeah. contour integral that gave rise to this one. And you illustrated it in the beginning with some classic example of the Dedekind eta function. Uh, so for uh, Jacobi eta functions, or more, more, more generally Jacobi, Jacobi forms, similar kind of uh, contour integration is the thing that gives rise to the Rademacher expansion, or Rademacher type expansion. That is right, yeah. Even for the Jacobi form. That's right, yeah. That's that's what Ferrari and uh, oh, okay. they, uh, they and um, uh, Valentin did. That's yes. right. Yeah. In the Galarian approach, when when you say, when you included that uh, extra derivative kind of advantages in the contour, you, you were still going following your philosophy of doing the evolving to the first. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, but, but then you did some change of variable yes. between sigma or something like that. Yeah. Uh, is, is that change of variables, does it have any interpretation in terms of flipping cycles, in terms of SL2, or, or, or is it just, you know, that I'm just wondering whether it has an interpretation. It has an interpretation in terms of um, the because it, 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 it's the same object, but it, it, it could have an interpretation in terms of the action of the duality group or something. Perhaps it could explain why the picture may be so different. That, that, that's the reason why I'm asking the question. Well, um, it, it, is related related to, to, it is related to, uh, to the axial dilaton modulus of uh, heterotic string theory. Okay. At least when you put it on the summit classical, uh, summit classical value. Okay. But, um, so semi-classical, it has that interpretation. Okay. But other than that, I, I would not know. So then you say that in the literature, uh, in your opinion, there is no, there is no good first principle derivation for one measure right. in the quantum end of the That's right. right. So, so, uh, so you see in the end of the white story, in the n equals to white story, there is um, there is a measure, a measure given by the determinant of an object called f by j. There is also a one loop, uh, a one loop um, determinant thing. That is well understood, but it's this object here, which in the n equals to eight case had to be corrected by a c, c being. Um, the analog of what I've called gamma delta. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's this inclusion here that, that, that requires, that, 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 is, that was put in my head. And, we, and in any case before, it's more complicated. Uh -huh. um, this C gets replaced by M2. This was the thing that characterized the uh, poles yeah. of one and also uh, two, two, two further Latin entry, and entries. So, so we do this postulate, then we can match things, but we don't have an understanding, a first principle understanding of that. <coughs> okay, thanks. Thank you.